Hello and welcome to the video. In this video we'll be looking at everything Vienna Lager, right from style guidelines for competition, how to write your own recipes to this style, as well as brewing and fermentation. But before we go into all of that, let's take a quick look at the history of this style. This beer style started life in 1841 and was quite a revolution at the time, as it combined kilned malt with lager yeast, which was something very new back then. The history behind this is actually quite amusing though, as the brewer responsible actually discovered a new type of kilning process during visits to breweries in England that made this style what it is now. Rumour has it that the inventor of this style, one Anton Dreyer, went as far as stealing samples of wool and yeast for later analysis, which led to his so-called discovery of Vienna malt. This is clearly the prominent factor behind this style. This Austrian brewer then went to live in Hungary, where he became the fifth richest person in that country. Let us now look at the BJCP guidelines for this style, simplifying them a little as we go. The BJCP categorised this style under European Amber Lager, saying that aroma-wise you should expect a moderately rich malt aroma from either or both Vienna or Munich malt. They say this could also include a light toasted presence, but that this should be less intense than an Oktoberfest style. Furthermore, the character from yeast should be clean and lager-like with no fruity esters. Also, that hop aroma should be low to none, as should the caramel side of things. In regards to appearance, they want light red amber to copper, bright clarity and a large off-white persistent head. The flavour should have soft and elegant complex malts to start with a balanced bitterness finish. Some toasted flavour, no roast or caramel flavour with a fairly dry finish. They also expect both malt and hop bitterness in the aftertaste, low to no hop flavour. In terms of mouthfeel, they expect a medium light to medium body with a gentle creaminess with moderate carbonation. The beer should be smooth and moderately crisp on the finish, with perhaps a little bit of alcohol warming. This has an overall impression of being a beer with soft, elegant maltiness that dries out on the finish to avoid being too sweet. At the bottom here, I provided the vital statistics. This completes the BJC recommendations. Some might like to screenshot this page for future reference. Let's now look at recipe writing to this style. So if you are looking to write a Vienna Lager recipe, then your recipe should include the following malts and ratio guidelines. I guess it should come as no surprise that Vienna malt will feature heavily usually in this style. This malt adds a deeper colour than usual base malts like Palau and Pilsner, and it contributes a very nice malty taste along with a nice level of body. Sadly this malt is unrecognised by some brewers and actually it has very very high potential in providing good fermentables in line with more recognised base malts like Palau and Pilsner malt. Within this style Vienna will usually dominate the grain bill at between 70 to 85% but some versions will share the base malt with Pilsner malt and or Munich malt. This is to lower the maltiness and Vienna like flavours if desired. Usually this will be at around 70 to 85% of the combined malts with Vienna, usually being at least 40% of that. Munich will provide a malty and somewhat grainy taste to this style, and can also add toasty notes which is in keeping with the style. Munich is usually used at ratios of up to 30% and can work nicely to add complexity. Pilsner will not contribute much flavour, but it will offer a cleanliness that should be valued. This is certainly an area to do your own experimentation around. You will see my recipe later, but it is important to make your own judgments. Caramel Munich is also a popular choice of grain for this style, but be careful with the type that you use, and stick to lower colour versions for competitions. Remember, slight roastiness is fine, but not caramel. A ratio of 5 to 8% is wise for competition, though in my opinion this level is not lending itself to actually the best end beer for taste. Shame really. And then we have melanoidin. Not all Vienna lagers will have this, but when it is present expect it to be at low levels of between 2 to 3%. What this grain essentially does is impart rich malt tones along with slight notes of biscuit and honey. 
it is designed to replace the very time-consuming process of decoction mashing. Some will argue that it fails to do this completely though. Personally, I enjoy the effect enough and enjoy not having to do a decoction mash, each to their own there of course. Crystal malt is also found in this style from time to time and this will also need to be on the low side at usually between 3 to 5%. If brewing to style then go low on this and avoid crystal again that is high in EBC to stay on point with colour. These malts are mostly about colour and adding nice background flavour notes. And lastly we have chocolate malt. Chocolate malt is used at low levels between 1-2% to in some brews of this style. In a brew of this type it is used for extra subtle flavouring in the direction of coffee and chocolate but not quite. Again, be careful to choose one that is not too dark to keep this in BJCP style, if that matters to you. Let's now look at hops that are useful for this style. In terms of flavouring and aroma hops, there are three main types. These are Hallertauer, Herzbrucker and Mittelfru. You will find that quite often these will have names after the main name I list here, and sometimes two of the names will also be mixed. Do not worry about this, these are simply references to the regions where the hops are grown. They are all very similar. This style usually has one fairly late hop addition that is used at between 15 to 10 minutes before the end of the boil. Going any later will not really bring you into style, so be careful of this if competition is your aim. These hops will impart mild herbal and spicy notes that are familiar to lagers and wheat beers. If you are not going to style and want a little extra citrus twist, then the American Hop Liberty will give you nice results. For bittering I would recommend either Magnum or North Down. Both of these hops will be in keeping for this style and offer a very clean level of nice bittering. It would be normal to add this bittering hop at the very start of the boil. The suggested bu gu ratio for a Vienna Lager is 0.49. Always try to be within a point or so of this for competition entries. This ratio is bittering units compared to gravity and is the beer's balance. Let us now look at yeast choices for the Vienna Lager style. Here is what I would recommend with both liquid and dry options. Do not be fooled into thinking one that has an advantage over the other. For most people, dry yeast will provide just as good results, cheaper and with less hassle. Liquid yeast just has the advantage in terms of more choice and as a result of this you can get something very specific to your taste. In terms of fermentation with these types of yeast, I would recommend the following method. Start off by pitching your lager yeast at an early owl temperature. Then, over a period of between 3-4 to four hours, cool this down to the low range for that yeast. This will lower the lag period. Then, once fermentation starts, hold at this low temperature until you have 50% attenuation, or to say this in more simple terms, until half of the brew's sugar has been eaten. So if you have a beer that started at 1.050 gravity, for example, wait until you are at 1.025. This is on the basis that your final gravity is 1000, and is just used as an easy to understand example. Once you reach this point, then start adding at 1 degree Celsius per day until you reach around 20 to 21 degrees Celsius, or 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This will speed up your lager's fermentation time without any negative effects. Once fermentation is over, then it is considered good practice to lager the beer for at least 2 to 3 weeks. This is where you hold the beer at low temperatures. I would recommend temperatures between 1 to 5 degrees Celsius for this. Also, I personally feel that when you go to 1 degree Celsius, this does compromise flavour some, and I prefer temperatures closer to between 3 to 5 for this reason. Not everyone will taste this difference, however. Our taste buds are all unique, so the best way forward for you is to do your own testing and see what you prefer. Um, one more thing though. There is an even quicker method. Use Norwegian Kveik. Sigmund Jana's Kveik is known to offer a very convincing lager profile when it is fermented at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. As shown on screen now, there are isolate versions of this available in commercial form, as well as farm versions which are multi-strain. I would recommend you obtain the farm version from a Facebook group called Kveik Sherb Salg. 
They are friendly people on this group and have no problem in speaking with English. Whichever version you decide to go with, this yeast will ferment in a very fast time, will require no lagering and will taste great within one week. A no-brainer as I would say. I will now share with you one of my tried and tested recipes for this style. This recipe dates back quite some years and represents some reworking from the classic recipe to give it more flavour. You may need to tweak it a little if you want it to be totally within the constraints expected by the BJCP, but it does depend on how strict they want to be. I will cover what you need to tweak to style as we go, just in case. I will share this recipe on the Brewfather platform via a link, which you will find in this video's description along with the full recipe. So you can see that this recipe is 0.1% stronger in alcohol than the BJCP would like, but you would probably get away with this and the one point difference in BUGU ratio. I do not suppose that anyone would actually taste the difference anyway. Here is the mash schedule for this one. Nothing fancy needed here these days and this cookie cutter schedule will do the job nicely. And here is the grain bill. You will note the extra use of Caramel Munich here at 12.3% of the grain bill. If you wish to enter this for competition then bring it down to 5-8% to but most agree that this ratio tastes better. A beer judge may not detect caramel at this ratio but this will of course vary so be on the safe side. I believe it improves the style personally and brewing to improve style should be really part of what home brewing really is about. You will also note that I'm using a large amount of Vienna malt to a small amount of Pilsner malt for the base. I have found that through trial and error that this works best for me and those that have tasted the difference over the years. Your taste could well differ though so this is an area for further testing for you. The Carafa malt here is a chocolate malt by Weyermann and like the Melanoidin malt offers some background complexity and flavour that I really feel makes this style sing. And here is my hop schedule. I go very traditional on the hops for this style. Here I am simply using the hops for balance for the most part. My interest is in keeping this beer a malt forward style but as I mentioned earlier you could experiment further by adding in things like Liberty Hops and this will keep it similar but add in some citrus flavours. It will not be to style anymore of course but hey it is great to experiment and you could add in zero minute additions and dry hopping if you want to turn the direction. Okay, so yeast wise, yes, naturally I use Quake. Vosjanis is very tried and tested at temperatures of 25 degrees C or lower to give a nice clean lager like profile. This does mean it takes a little longer to ferment out, but I found it worked out just great after four days. The end beer produced by this recipe has that classic Vienna malty caramel with slight nut aroma and a little malt sweetness. This malty flavour has a bread to toast like quality along with a slight roastiness that is smoothed down to a dry finish. I have never detected an alcohol note and this is the way I want it. This beer has a clean feel to its flavours. I generally find that with this recipe there is generally very little hop presence with a nice balance between the malt and the hops. I, I note that the extra use of Caramel Munich and Pilsner balance off the graininess that can sometimes be too present in this style. I've also noticed that a lot of people find this a very sessionable type of beer but do comment on how flavourful it is for its alcohol level. I brewed this style just recently with the summer coming up and here is some footage from that brew. For this brew I used the very new to Europe 65 litre Brewzilla, which so far has worked very nicely, so I should think that I'll be reviewing this on the channel in the weeks to come, once I have 5 or more brews under my belt with it. I don't know what it is about these amber beer styles, but they always look so nice during the mash, and this one as you can see was no different. As you can see on this 65 litre system, this amount of malt barely touches the surface of this large grain basket, but the level of efficiency was impressive. After using this sweet Brutals paddle, nothing else I own feels good enough, so I've been using it for all of my brewing. There was a nice protein head on this Vienna Lager, and this paddle just ate it up. Once most of this protein was stirred in, I then added the first hop addition, and you can see we've got a beautiful coloured wort here. 
With three and a half kilowatts worth of heating, this 21 litre brew just breezed by and I decided to see what I could do to use the grandfather water meter and counterflow chiller. It really was as simple as adding the temperature probe from this old HANA digital thermometer into the water meter and hey presto, I had an accurate counterflow chiller wart temperature. Nice and easy. Here is a sample of the resulting wart. This photo's colour is not quite true, but the Easter sun was burning brightly this year. Here is a quick look inside my fermenter after the third day of fermentation and the crossin that is still left. As you can see, this was previously close to the top of the fermenter and gave me a quick wave when I opened the fermenter for top cropping. I find it truly amazing how versatile Vos Jana's Quake is. I have used it to ferment all sorts of different beer styles and it just seems to fit every time. Even at this much lower temperature for lager, it took off with hardly any lag time at all, despite the fact that I have used it for the vast majority of the time at higher temperatures. Very nice. This now brings this video to a close. If you have any questions, then please let me know via YouTube or Facebook. I do hope that you found this video to be useful, interesting and enjoyable. If appropriate, then please like this video on YouTube. And if you've not done so already, then please subscribe. I regularly post new content. Happy brewing!